Well, it's president-elect now. I'm Philip M. Bailey, and this is a special edition of States of America with USA Today, continuing our coverage of the 2020 presidential election. And key to Joe Biden's victory was the Keystone State. I'm here with J.D. Prose, reporter for USA Today's Pennsylvania Capitol Bureau. J.D., what's going on, my man? Lots, Philip, lots. <laughs> right. Uh, let me ask you at the outset here. Explain to folks how, importantly, but also and from where did President Trump's lead evaporate in Pennsylvania? Uh, well, it was, yeah, it, was, it wasn't a surprise to people in Pennsylvania paying attention because of the mail-in ballot situation. 2.6 million mail-in ballots uh, sent out uh, for the general election, the vast majority Democratic. Uh, and because the Republican-controlled legislature refused to give counties more time to begin uh, pre-canvassing and processing those ballots, not counting them, simply pre-canvassing and preparing them to be counted. Uh, county officials for months said, uh, if we aren't given more time, then this will be the case, that it will be an extended count. So initially it appeared as if President Trump had this lead in Pennsylvania, and as those millions of mail-in ballots uh, were counted slowly, uh, you know, the lead began to evaporate and Biden began picking up more and more numbers, especially out of Philadelphia, heavily Democratic, sometimes batches coming in uh, 80% uh, for Joe Biden and uh, in uh, Allegheny County out here in Southwestern PA in Pittsburgh, also heavily Democratic. So, you know, as everyone saw, uh, you know, a painful wait, but slowly but surely those numbers began to come in in Joe Biden's favor and uh, the percentages were just too much for uh, President Trump to overcome. Right. And J.D., I think that's really important for folks to remember. Right. I mean, it's it's easy to get locked up and caught up in these conspiracy theories on on social media. But again, as you pointed out, because of the legislature didn't allow those mail in ballots to be counted early enough, all the in-person uh, votes were sort of accumulated first. So then people come out with this idea of, oh, President Trump has this huge, almost insurmountable lead right. in Pennsylvania. But as you're counting those mail-in ballots more and more, uh, things uh, begin to change. I noticed, J.D., that the Republican Attorneys uh, General Association announced that they're going to have a press conference where they're going to talk about legal action versus Pennsylvania's mail-in ballots. First, let me ask, what is the issue that Republican officials are taking with those? And would a challenge even come close to changing the outcome at this point? Uh, I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure what their issue is. Uh, you know, Republicans have thrown out lots of questions, insinuations about uh, the mail-in ballots. I haven't heard of anything specific uh, that they've accused Pennsylvania of doing or, or uh, anything specific happening in the process. And uh, to be honest, I don't know what their standing would be to intervene in Pennsylvania's uh, counting or mailing balloting process, uh, being AGs in another state. Uh, obviously, there are questions been raised by the Republicans, uh, you know, Trump's campaign and some Republican officials uh, about, uh, you know, only counting legal ballots, quote unquote. That's exactly what's happening. I said that the other day. Uh, you know, there are no illegal votes being counted. Uh, Nothing specific, though. You know, I, I've seen nothing along the lines of fraud or malfeasance into somehow right. skewing the election for Joe Biden. It's simply a matter of you know taking this long because of the situation uh, caused by the Republican legislature's failure to give counties more time to process these mail-in ballots. Right. And there seems to be nationwide uh, J.D., sort of a, two minds from Republicans, those who are saying, hey, this is over. Joe Biden is president elect. And those who are insinuating some sort of, you know, like you said, illegal votes or some sort of malfeasance going on. I want to know if in Pennsylvania, which is an important battleground state, have Republicans in Pennsylvania, whether voters, party leaders, activists, elected officials, Trump supporters, have they accepted that Joe Biden is president elect or are they more leaning towards the there's something here that's going on that's wrong and we could ch change this election. And not that I've seen so far, I think a lot of it is driven by uh, the conservative media and, and what the president's saying and some of these comments uh, by Republican officials who simply won't 
uh, you know, express complete faith in the process. They couch it in terms of, uh, you know, well, we, we want to make sure every vote's counted. We want to make sure it's done correctly when there's no indication that it hasn't been done correctly. Uh, you know, you have uh, U.S. Senator Senator Pat Toomey, who came out the other day and uh, said, you know, straight up on uh, NBC Today show that the accusations by the president were unsubstantiated. And yet you still have uh, these comments and this hesitancy by Republican officials and uh, at, at all levels. And that trickles down, uh, you know, to the rank and file and it goes down to, you know, regular you know, everyday Republicans who, you know, just have that suspicion because that's what they've heard repeatedly. Right. Well, one thing I think we definitely want to do is shout out to the poll workers and the vote counters, right? Those were folks on the front lines. J.D., have you seen or heard anything from them on how tense this election was versus past ones? Especially I was hearing reports and as those across the country were about some, you know, person trying to come up there with a gun, some, you know, believe gunmen, but also a protest protest people try to barge in uh, i believe a gunman was arrested on his way to one location correct in philadelphia yeah that was over um on the eastern side in southeast pa in philadelphia where someone did show up uh with some weapons um i haven't talked to any poll workers specifically uh, but you know the the concern leading up to the election was uh, a lot about uh militia activity uh threats uh, especially in high minority communities with folks going in armed and maybe trying to intimidate black voters or, or Spanish speaking voters. Uh, and that didn't seem to materialize, uh, thankfully. Right. Uh, obviously, there were issues. There was uh, there were confrontations. You heard about them uh, across the state, uh, which generally you know happens in every election. It was just more tense and emotional in this election. Uh, so any you know, a, a machine breaking or a ballot issue or something was heightened and then went uh, you know, viral on social media. You know, you had up in Erie uh, a, a rumor that ballot, you know, Republican ballots were being thrown away, which was just simply uh, made up and then spread like wildfire to the point where Erie officials had to address the matter. Uh, but for the most part, like I said, those those uh, concerns and worries about widespread intimidation and everything uh, didn't occur. Right. Well, J.D. Pros, our man in Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining us here on States of America. Anytime. Thanks, Phil. No problem. So Georgia is the most surprising turn of a state from red to blue. Joe Biden won Georgia. Can you believe it? And now voters there in the Peach State hold the Senate's future in their hands. Here to discuss is Raina Cash, executive editor of Savannah Morning News. Raina, how are you? Good, good. How are you? Very good. Listen, um, is it official? Is Georgia now a blue state? At least at the top of the ticket. <laughs> it it uh, bared out that way, didn't it? Um, Joe Biden um, is up right now. Va counting continues, but he's up. Uh, over 10,000 votes in his favor. Uh, they expect to finish that counting uh, today. And of course, that's going to go into a recount. But um, unless there's some dramatic change uh, at the very top of the ticket, uh, Georgia has turned blue in, in Biden's favor, I think, to the surprise of a lot of outsider, outsiders, perhaps not as much for people who have been on the ground active here in the state. But I think uh, for the rest of the country, uh, it has come as quite a shock. Now, last week, Raina, you and I were watching as the numbers, so similar to Pennsylvania, you know, dwindling for President Trump as the count continued. Um, let me address and let's call out the president specifically on this question about the military provisional military ballots, these overseas ballots that were about, I believe, 8,800 or approximately 8,800 that were still out there. Uh, that was supposed to get there by Friday, the deadline. What was the status of those uh, provisional, I guess, or military overseas ballots? Were they all counted? Did some not make it in time? Uh, and will that be something that would change the outcome of Georgia? Uh, as a matter of fact, Philip, we uh, just got an update here within the last uh, few minutes that um, the Secretary of State announced that 7,700, some 7,700 of those ballots that were uh, requested absentee ballots, uh, military ballots were not returned. And so those will not be counted um, in this in this final tally. Uh, that 
you know, that's a lot of ballots and it, it certainly could have made a difference. Uh, you don't know which direction or how those folks uh, would have voted, but uh, that's a lot of uh, unreturned ballots. And he just announced that here in the last five minutes. Did the secretary of state give a reason why? I mean, were they just simply late or, or was there an issue with the, the postal service or why were those ballots not received? Uh, there was no reason given for that. Of course, they had to be in by um, five o'clock on Friday. Uh, the military and overseas ballots uh, have a little bit more time to arrive as long as they're postmarked um, in time by Election Day and they have a little bit longer to get here. But um, they, they just didn't come. Maybe folks just chose to, to opt out. Um, it doesn't appear that there was something going on with the uh, Postal Service or anything like that. But right. I'm sure as the Republican Party continues to uh, sort of look under the hood at this outcome, that's something that uh, Donald Trump and, and his campaign uh, will be asking. But it appears that, uh, at least for now, that they just didn't get here in time or that people didn't return them. Gotcha. Let's go back to the question of Georgia going blue for Biden. Who deserves credit? We all know Stacey Abrams' name. You know, she's someone who's shouted out often. But outside of Stacey Abrams, and, and feel free, Raina, to give her as much grace as you see fit. But outside of her, uh, who should be given credit for Biden winning Georgia? Importantly, how did they do it? Were they appealing to rural voters, white rural voters? Were they registering new voters in the urban areas? Was it simply Georgia's demographic shift because of the growth and, and economic growth of Atlanta? I thought I think, um, you know, we should give Stacey Abrams credit. Right. She saw um, she saw the opportunity there to to change the dynamics of this race uh, early on. She lost in a, a close race to uh, Brian Kemp uh, for governor two years ago. And uh, her fair fight campaign seized on that opportunity, registered uh, over a million voters. Uh, but to your point, she wasn't alone. Um, I think some credit can be given to uh, Nakima Williams. Uh, mm -hmm. She replaced uh, John Lewis, uh, John Lewis's seat uh, after his passing. She was a uh, state house leader here in the state of Georgia and uh, was very active in, in getting out the vote and supporting uh, this campaign. But I think above all, the credit uh, is Donald Trump's, quite frankly, um, you know, People in, in many places around um, the state, even if they did not flip from red to blue, uh, his margin of victory uh, in those counties uh, was quite a bit smaller than it was during 2016. Uh, Donald Trump won Georgia by five points over Hillary Clinton in 2016. And now we're in a situation uh, where there's a runoff. So there is uh, there was a repudiation against him, even in those rural, smaller counties, not just in the larger cities. Yeah, I believe the term often is called strategic non-voting. So the non-vote actually may have hurt him more than anything else. Uh, Georgia could let's switch gears here. Let's look forward. Right. It, it seems that even with a recount, that Biden will probably win Georgia and turn that blue. But you all down in Georgia have a whole different set of races that really. Uh, the rest of the country should be a pay, should be paying attention to. Georgia could determine who controls the U.S. Senate. Yeah. First, Raina, let me ask you, explain to us, just go through the players, explain to us who all is running and, and they, you know, who all has the runoff. And, and also, why do you all have runoffs down in Georgia in the first place? <laughs> well, uh, there are two Senate races here. Uh, Kelly Leffler, who was appointed after Johnny Isaacson uh, retired, uh, Kelly Leffler is in a race against Raphael Warnock, uh, who is the pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church, the famous Ebenezer Baptist Church, Dr. King's Church here in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be a really tight race and or has been a tight race. It'll remain to be seen whether that bears out in the runoff. And then in the other race, you have an incumbent in David Perdue, and he's running against uh, a relative newcomer in uh, John Ossoff. Um, there are some interesting dynamics in this in this Senate race and whether the Democrats will turn out um, for their candidates as they did in uh, this general election and whether that was just sort of a, a Trump push to the polls and if that will be uh, replicated in the Senate race. 
in Georgia, the the winner has to win by 50 percent plus one. And it, that did not happen in either of these races. Uh, so uh, they do have a runoff. Uh, Doug Collins was the Trump back Senate candidate um, on the side for Kelly Leffler. But Kelly Leffler ended up e ending up beating him. And she's someone who it has cl closely been on Donald Trump's coattails. She often says that she has a 100 percent uh, record in voting in favor of Trump. And uh, her whole campaign really has been all around Donald Trump. So we'll see whether uh, the fact that he lost here, uh, whether that makes a difference for her in this race against Warnock. One thing I've noticed that Warnock and Ossoff are basically running as a ticket. Right. I mean, it, it seems like Democrats are trying to combine the two of them rather than saying here are two separate Senate races. Real quickly, are Republicans doing the same thing as Loeffler and Purdue? Are they running as a ticket um, and, and maybe under the, the Trump banner? Uh, are they running as a ticket just like the Democrats seem to be doing? It certainly doesn't appear to be as okay. closely linked on the Republican side as it is for the Democratic side. And I think the Democrats have to do that. Um, just because of the dynamics of what has what has been uh, this state as as a red state. Um, and so they are combining their their energy um, into one. And they're both newcomers. So there are some similarities there between uh, Warnock and Ossoff. Right. On the other side, you have um, Purdue, who has a, a lot of experience uh, compared to Kelly Loeffler, who was uh, just appointed. Right. Um, and she's also very uh, she's linked to uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, who is a supporter of QAnon. Right. Uh, she, conspiracy she, yeah. yeah, this conspiracy theory. And she has um, she's uh, described herself as uh, as conservative as Attila the Hun. <laughs> you know, so she's she's right. very different in some ways than uh, David Perdue. And so I can see them not necessarily walking hand in hand in this race. Gotcha. And also, isn't Kelly Loeffler, doesn't she own, partially own a WNBA team too? Hasn't there been some issues with, with that as well? Or am I mistaken? I think about somebody else. No, no, that's, that's absolutely right. right. And uh, she, she's the whole Black Lives Matter movement, which the WNBA has been very supportive of. And the uh, Atlanta WNBA team here has been very supportive of. They endorse Warnock as a team and individuals on that team uh, have endorsed Warnock and um, continue to do so even now. And she has, you know, spoken out very harshly against the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so even though she owns this team or is a part owner of this team, uh, that team itself and even the organization is not necessarily behind Kelly Loeffler. Gotcha. And to explain the premise of what we were talking about a moment ago, Raina, the reason why Georgia has potentially the control of the Senate, Georgia voters has that in their hands, is that we have right now a 53-47 Republican majority in the Senate led by Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of my home state of Kentucky. Democrats picked up one seat, net gain one seat in the 2020 elections, um, so that would make it 52 to 48. But if the two Democrats win, and it's 50-50, then pres uh, Vice President-elect uh, Kamala Harris would be the leader of the Senate, which would basically give the Democrats and Chuck Schumer control of the Senate. So that's why these, these two races are important. If the Democrats win both races, Mitch McConnell's not in control of the Senate. If they win only one, he is. Um, let me ask you a, a more procedural question before we uh, conclude here. Uh, will Georgia, you think, explore ranked voting as a result of this? I mean, you know, I, I understand what you said about the runoffs, not all states do that. Not all states do ranked voting. Or is ranked voting something that was supported by former presidential candidate Andrew Yang, for example? Is that seen as a little too far to the left for Georgia's tastes? I should note, too, that Andrew Yang uh, tweeted the other day that he and his wife are moving to Georgia, uh, at, least, <laughs> okay. at least for this for this campaign period to try and help get these uh, Democrats through. Uh, I don't we have a Republican governor. Um, I don't see uh, it's a Republican uh, led led state uh, on the state level here. And uh, they picked up some wins on the state level. And so while what we saw at the top of the ticket with Donald Trump and Joe Biden um, might change some things here um, when it comes down to uh, making that kind of legislative change that you just mentioned, I don't see Georgia going in that direction. Let me go back to the politics of these two runoff races. Now, 
Democrats usually don't show up like they do in presidential races and other races, off year races, midterms, etc. But there is also some concern. I saw Eric Erickson, a conservative commentator who's also from Georgia, him making the point of concerns about the depression that, you know, the, or the depressed Trump voter. Do you expect President Trump and his voters to stay engaged or, be, you know, because he's lost the presidential race and many Republicans and conservatives on his side of the, of the issue feel like maybe some of these elections in other states and in Georgia were stolen. There's no evidence of that, by the way. Uh, but, that you know, the feeling that the election was stolen, do they just take their ball and go home? I don't think that's what's going to happen. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just think that um, recognizing what it means to control the Senate and how that can either make Joe Biden more effective or ineffective uh, overall, uh, not ineffective, but might, might not make him as effective uh, as president if uh, the Democrats do not have control of the Senate. I think that's going to resonate with voters here. And so uh, those who voted for Trump, those who did not vote for Trump, but are Republicans and would still like to see a Republican led government, right. even if Joe Biden is the president, I think that alone will drive them to the polls. Right. Those never Trumpers, those Lincoln Project Republicans, I think, might want to go back to uh, the Republican column as a check on, on Joe Biden. Uh, Raina Cash, executive editor of Savannah Morning News. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of States of America. Thank you. All right, folks. Well, thanks for joining us again, like I said, on this special edition of States of America with USA Today. I'm your host, Philip M. Bailey. Stay engaged as USA Today continues to cover both President-elect Joe Biden and President Donald Trump in these final weeks and months of his administration. Thanks for joining us. Peace.